and welcome to our worship at Discovery Church this morning. We're glad that you've been able to join us, and we hope that you are enjoying this warm start to summer weather that we've been having this last week. We want to highlight one item for you today. Mark your calendars for Saturday, June 27th, as we come together for our night of worship on the lawn. You will need to register for this event, and registration is now live on the Discovery app. Psalm 29, verse 2 states, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. As we continue our worship this morning, let's pray. Dear Lord, your voice, your word is powerful and majestic. As we offer our praise and thanks to you today, may our songs and our words honor you and bring glory to your name. Help us to focus our hearts and our minds on you. Quiet our spirits and strengthen our souls. We love you, and we worship you now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Miss Pat has a kid's moment for us this morning, and I do believe that Olga will be joining us as well. Pat? Today, boys and girls, Pastor Art is going to talk to us about a man from the Bible named Enoch. We don't know a lot about him, but we do know that he had faith, and that he walked with and pleased God. Now, wouldn't it be really cool if we could, like Adam and Eve, physically walk with God each day and talk to him, telling him what's bugging us or getting his help to solve a certain problem? Well, we know Enoch didn't physically walk with God, and we can't do that either until we get to heaven. But even though we can't see with our physical eyes and talk to God face to face, we can still have a relationship with him and walk with him every day. So how do we do that? Well, I know if you were sitting right down here with me right now, and I asked you that question, you would tell me that we could pray, we could read the Bible, we could sing praise and worship songs, we could talk to God throughout the day, and all those things help us to walk with God. But another important part of walking with God comes from James chapter 1, verses 22 to 24. And it tells us to not merely be listeners of the word, but to be doers of the word. We have a song that we sing that comes right from these verses. And it tells us to not just listen, but to just do it. These verses go on to tell us that reading God's word and doing nothing about what we read it's like looking in a mirror and seeing that, oh, maybe I need to comb my hair, then putting it down and walking away and do nothing about it. To help us understand this a little bit better, Olga is back with us today. Let's see what she has to say. <laughs> well, it's about time for me to get ready to go meet my friends at the restaurant. I'm so excited. I haven't been to a restaurant in three months, and I haven't had a chance to sit down and talk with my friends. I can't wait. Well, I better look in the mirror and see if I'm ready to go. Ooh, hmm. I guess I should be taking these curlers out. I really don't want curlers in my hair when I go to the restaurant. And, oh, I'm still in my robe. Well, you know, since we've been at home most of the time, I've been in my casual clothes. And I've even been in my pajamas for most of the day on some days. Well, and oh, this face cream. I forgot I had it on. But you know, the jar said it would make my face so soft and smooth. Oh, that's my friend now. Let me see. Oh, are you ready? Oh, both of you can come? Oh, that's great. I can't wait. All right, I'm about to walk out the door. I'll see you soon. I can't wait to catch up. Talk to you later. Bye. Well, I guess it's time for me to go. Can you imagine, boys and girls, looking in the mirror, seeing what Olga saw, and then going to the restaurant without doing anything about it? We would never do that. 
But do we sometimes do that with God? Do we read the Bible and see that he says things like, treat each other kindly. Be careful about what comes out of your mouth. Put the needs of others before your own. And then just put down our Bible, and when we're with people, we kind of do almost the exact opposite. Instead of doing that, we need to let God's word be like that mirror that shines in our hearts, shows us maybe what we need to change, and then because we love God, we ask him to help us be the person he wants us to be. Now, it's not easy. It's not easy for kids. It's not easy for parents. In fact, it's not easy for any of us. But it is part of walking with God. So like our verses and our song tell us, let's look into the word, not just listen to it, but let's make sure we just do it. And now we're going to continue to worship and praise God with Barry and Sue.
Psalm 29, 11 says, The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people, and may the Lord bless his people with peace. Each week, we set aside this time during our service so that we can give our gifts and offerings to God. Just this last week, six of our missionary partners shared how our financial gifts and prayers have helped them to encourage believers they serve as well as to reach out to people who still need Jesus. Thank you for giving your gifts to our church office, through our Discovery app, or by texting DCMN to 77977. As we prepare to give now, let's pray. Lord, we know that giving is an opportunity for us to show our love and our trust in you. We give to you now to worship you, to meet people's needs, and to advance your kingdom here and around the world. Bless these gifts and multiply them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one depends, my righteousness, oh, God, how I need you, where sin runs. Your grace is more Where grace is found Is where you are Where you are Lord, I am free Holiness is Christ in me been involved in a trust walk? A trust walk is an exercise where a person who is blindfolded is led by someone else. Uh, they're 
told to step up, step over, step off. I know when I've been involved in those trust walks, I always thought that the second person putting on the blindfold was exhibiting the most trust uh, because the other person had already gone and so could pretty much do whatever they wanted if they wanted to mess with the person because they couldn't have the same thing done back to them. Uh, it takes trust to be able to be uh, involved with someone that way. I'm also, I'm intrigued when I see a, a limited sight person working with a dog who's been trained to be able to guide them, to be able to watch the interaction between the two. It's just fascinating to see the trust that is displayed to be able to um, follow and know that the dog has your best interest at heart, but at the same time for that dog to know that their person is going to do what's needed. Uh, thinking about trust walks, I, I got to thinking, uh, the last three months, we've all been involved in one massive trust walk. Uh, the problem, as I've looked at it, though, is that uh, those of us uh, being led, where we have the blindfold on, uh, we finally take a look at the person who's leading us, and we realize they have a blindfold on, too. So it's been kind of like the blind leading the blind. I know in many cases in trying to do what we've navigated, getting to the point where we're going to be able to be back together again for our night of worship on the lawn. There are times I've felt like I've been blindfolded while trying to figure out what's the best way. So thanks for praying because as you have prayed, we've been asking God to lead us. And God is someone we can always trust. We're going to see that today as we continue our faith journey in Hebrews 11. We meet Enoch today. Enoch is the first person in the Bible of whom it said that it's a person who walked with God. He's an original model of what it means to live by faith. So drawing upon the example of Enoch... The writer of Hebrews provides us with the central theme of our series that we're involved in right now, living to please God. We read in 11, uh, Hebrews 11, verses 5 and 6, By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he could not experience death. Oh, it says he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Building off of that, the writer then says, and without faith, this is our theme verse, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. It's from Enoch we learn that the only way to please God is to walk or to live by faith. Those two words are used interchangeably. When we see the word walk, it's uh, talking about the way that we live as we walk by faith. Since that's the case, we're going to examine what Enoch did, uh, what it was that pleased God. And once we know what he did, we'll be able to see how we compare to Enoch so we can know where God needs to work with us, needs to work in us so that we can also trust God and have God be able to say that we please God him. Let's pray about that. Father God, it would be so incredible to be able to have that sense that your spirit could give where you would say, you please me. The way that you trust me, uh, I'm just so glad to be able to be in this place where as I lead my son, you follow. So God, to just speak to my heart and soul, uh, to be able to surrender those places where I might think that I know better, and to be able to once again acknowledge that uh, you are the almighty God of this universe, and that you have given your spirit to be able to guide me on a daily basis, so that hopefully, God, you would be able to say that my walk of faith, that you're pleased by that. I surrender that to you and trust you to do that in the name of Jesus. Amen. 
So we're going to look at the characteristics of Enoch's faith walk and see what it is that he did. And the first characteristic we see is that Enoch, Enoch believed that God exists. And so when the subject is as important as pleasing God, it's wise to start at the beginning. And that's what our teacher does by taking us to the most basic starting point for faith that God exists. If you go back to the first two or three verses of Hebrews 11, you see that that's part of the whole description of a life of faith. There are so many ways that we can get caught up thinking that we can somehow please God. It may be the good deeds that we do. In other cases, it's the practice of a religion, a particular religion we think that God's going to be pleased by that. Some have even believed that God accepts people based on their national or ethnic origins. Uh, A sad, sad way to think that we'd be pleasing God. From Enoch, we know the only approach. The only approach that pleases God is living by faith. Enoch operated on faith. He lived by the conviction that what he hoped for and what he couldn't necessarily see with his physical eyes, that it was true. And so the starting point for a God-pleasing faith is the belief that God exists. Just what does it mean to believe that God exists? It's a much more general idea, much more than the general idea that people often voice that, you know, the man upstairs, uh, the man up there, he's in charge. Believing that God exists means believing that God is all that he claims to be. That kind of faith accepts what God says about himself as being spirit, as being infinite, as being omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, all those great theological concepts about an all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful God. It accepts that God is loving, that he loves us, but that he also has standards for righteousness, that he would love for us to be able to practice because we want to please Him. Uh, The believing that God exists, it understands that He is both a God of mercy and a God of justice, and that both of those operate together. When we believe that God exists, we accept God as God, even if we can't understand or explain completely what that means to someone. Believing that God exists means believing without being able to see him. Uh, John, the disciple of Jesus, he summarized the common experience of humanity when he writes in John 1.18 about the miracle that took place when Jesus came to earth. Uh, he said, no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side. The one who is at the Father's side has made him known. That was Jesus coming to earth, making him known. And so Jesus, the God, the one and only, is as close as we have ever come to being able to see God. Jesus could say to his disciples, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. For us, however, this is still a statement that needs to be accepted by faith. The faith that pleases God also then will examine the evidence The evidence that is provided that God exists. Theologians and philosophers have tried to prove or disprove the existence of God. And no one has ever succeeded completely on either side of that question. What we have been given, there is evidence that God gives us that he exists as it's reflected in the universe. I know for me, getting out in nature, it is a place to be able to see uh, the wonderful evidence of how God exists. That was true for King David as well. Uh, King David wrote, the heavens declare the glory of God. When you go out at night, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. Uh, He continues there in Psalm 19, there is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. It's a universal language through which God speaks. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. That kind of evidence about God 
It's also the reason that's presented by the Apostle Paul as uh, he worked trying to show the evidence that is there, why it's reasonable based on that evidence for God in his justice that he will punish evil. And so Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, he said, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them, and he explains how when he says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, uh, his eternal power and divine nature, they have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made And as a result, he says that we, as people, so that men are without excuse. So based on these reflections, over the years, uh, philosophers have uh, presented classic arguments for the existence of God. Uh, Some of these include the argument that comes from cause and effect. When you study how events take place, you will find that there is a cause for each effect that takes place. And so as you trace back through the series of cause and effect relationships, you eventually come to that place where you have to make the acknowledgement uh, what is known as the first cause, that there is a first cause that uh, triggers all of the rest that follows. Uh, There's also the argument from design and order. When you observe the universe, you will find evidence of design there, that there is a basic order, all of the laws of physics. And whether it be uh, the the human body, when you look at a hand and marvel at how it's able to work, Uh, when you look at the universe as a whole, or you study the food chains that exist that sustain life, or you look at the workings of the atmosphere that give us weather, or the precise tilt of the axis of the earth that provides seasons and makes life sustainable. There's design and there is order there. And if there is design and order, it follows that there must be a designer responsible for that design and order. And so the argument from design and order. Uh, There's also the argument from purpose. People, as people, we desire purpose, that there's a meaning, not just for life in general, but there's a meaning for my life. And that desire comes from someone who is the author of purpose and who builds that desire to find that meaning and purpose into people that we desire to have that. And then there's the argument from the idea of God consciousness, that there's this sense of something bigger, uh, of deity. People everywhere have an innate sense, this need of something more, something bigger, uh, a need for God. And that God consciousness, it's the source of religions. The consciousness that comes from someone who planted that within humanity. The reality, however, is as compelling as these arguments seem, none of them, none of them absolutely prove the existence of God. Ultimately, the reality of God must be accepted by faith. For believing in God, Enoch is commended. Enoch believed God existed and he built his life on that belief. That's his first faith characteristic. The second faith characteristic mentioned by the writer of Hebrews is that Enoch sought God's reward. Enoch built his life on the belief that God rewards those who earnestly seek him. Believing God exists provides meaning for life. Seeking God's rewards addresses our most basic motivation. Uh, Different forces motivate people. For some, it's making money. For some, it's making a name for themselves. For others, it's possessing power. Uh, Some people long to be loved. Uh, Jesus powerfully states this same truth about meaning in life. He put it this way in Matthew chapter 6. He said, seek first 
his kingdom and his righteousness. I think Enoch would say, amen. That's exactly how I lived my life, seeking the kingdom of God first and desiring his righteousness. Among the many motivations that exist, I wonder what motivates you? What is the centering force that provides direction and satisfaction as you live your life? The Bible tells us there's only one motivation that provides lasting meaning. Seeking God and His reward. When everything else is stripped away, when we come to that place where life is drawing to an end, the desire to hear God say, well done be able to have that sense that the way you've lived life, it's really pleased God. The only desire left and the only one that matters. The best part in what Jesus tells us comes in the rest of his statement. He says, seek first the kingdom of God, his kingdom, his righteousness. All of the other things those motivations, that desire for purpose, all of those things will be given to you as well. Satisfaction and meaning for life. That's the way Enoch lived, seeking that reward. The third characteristic given to us by the writer of Hebrews, we're told that, yes, Enoch walked with God. When we go back into Genesis, the author of Genesis in chapter 5, as he summarizes Enoch's life, uh, he, he says that Enoch walked with God there. He makes the same statement twice. It's really a stirring four-verse tribute to Enoch. Uh, we read there in Genesis chapter 5, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. We're going to see Methuselah more next week when we talk about Noah. And after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years, had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived 365 years. Enoch walked with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. This kind of a tribute, that's the kind of tribute which any honest seeker of God should long for. Let it be said of me, I walked with God. So the the phrase walking with God, as we want to say that I've been able to walk with God, it's used when the lifestyle of a follower of Jesus is described in the Bible. Uh, The Bible uh, paints a contrast between two ways of living. The Bible talks about the old walk, the old way of living life before Jesus, and a new walk, the new walk that comes after we make that life commitment to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, Paul writes to the Ephesians about this, contrasting those two ways of life in Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, we look first at the characteristics of the old walk. As, as Paul says to them, I, I tell you this, and I insist on it in the Lord. That this is something that's distinctive. It's important that the Lord insists on us understanding this, that you must no longer live or walk as the Gentiles do, those who are separate from God, because their way of living life, it is in the futility of their thinking. Uh, The way they've been living, it hasn't been working. They know it hasn't been working, at least as well as life could work, but they continue to pursue that even though they know that it's just not working. The reason they do that is because as we go to the next verse, we see that they are living in ignorance. It says that they are darkened in their understanding. They don't have that element of truth to be able to guide them. And they do that because they're living kind of dead to God. Uh, Paul says, separated from the life of God that we can have. They're dead to that part of uh, living life, that, that, that faith relationship as a follower of Jesus. And they do that stubbornly All of this is because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. They have rejected God. They've rejected the idea of God. And stubbornly, they continue to live, go down that course, even though they know it's not working. Here's where it ends up. 
having lost all sensitivity. It becomes a shameless way to live life, having lost all sensitivity to God, that there is a way to be able to please God. They've given themselves over to sensuality, and when they do that, so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, but even that's not enough with a continual lust for more. That's where the old walk ultimately takes us. Well, there's a new walk that's completely different. In the New Testament, they often symbolize this at the waters of baptism, where as we look into these next verses, we see it described where Paul says, you, however, did not come to know Christ that way. You've heard of him. You were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. And as a result of that, what happens is that new way of life that we take, where in regard to our former way of life, the former way of life, we put off that old self. In the New Testament, when they went to be baptized, they, they, they would uh, live this out where they would come to the edge of the water where they were going to be baptized, and the outer robe that they had on, they would take off. And this was to symbolize the old way of life that they were taking that off, a decisive action where I'm going to leave that behind, that which is being corrupted by all of the deceitful desires, I'm no longer going to live life that way. And the result was that I would be made new in the attitude of my mind. And that's what Paul describes in that next verse. Being made new where I have decided to become a follower of Jesus. I put on that new self. And so as it would come out of the water, they would put on a white robe to be able to symbolize the new desire that was there. Not for all of those other things which they'd left behind, but the desire became this. This really is the desire that describes the way that Enoch lived his life. Created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Walking with God leads you toward being like God. The question is, which way is your walk taking you? Toward God or away from God? Enoch definitely was walking with God. And as Enoch walked by faith, he was always walking with God and toward God. And so the fourth characteristic we see of Enoch in his walk, because of his walk, we're told he was taken from this life. Enoch pleased God with his faith. And all of this, all, all that takes place in his life, it's commendable. But it's, it's not the, the phenomenal event for which Enoch is most remembered. Uh, the writer of Hebrews starts with this event as he tells the story of Enoch's faith walk. Uh, in Hebrews 11.5, it's the first thing we see. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. Can you imagine that? He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. The Genesis, Genesis account states it this way, summarizes Enoch's life with these words. Enoch walked with God, then he was no more because God took him away. away. Enoch, along with the prophet Elijah, are reported to be the only two people to never experience physical death. How could this be? I don't know. How do they live now? I don't know. Are their bodies the same as when they were living here, or have they already been transformed with the new body? I don't know. Does God have the ability to do this? And as incredible as it may sound, I believe God. God has the ability to do this. 
just as he has the ability and the power to resurrect Jesus Christ and to resurrect one day all of those who have died to be able to enjoy eternal life. What we do know is Enoch walked with God. God was pleased by Enoch's faith, and God was so pleased that he chose to take Enoch away, and it's this phrase that sets Enoch apart. When you go into Genesis chapter 5, you see it's a summary of those from Adam to Noah. For all of the other people in that listing, the life summaries of all of those other people in Genesis 5 end with these words, and then he died, and then he died. For Enoch, he was no more because God took him away. You know, I wonder, are there any volunteers here today in 2020 where you'd like to be the third person to be able to enter into God's presence without experiencing death? I, I would love to have that, and that's one of the reasons we look forward to that great day of the second coming, because there will be some believers who never experience physical death. To be considered, however, right now as a candidate to be that third person, we know the requirement. We know it very clearly. The requirement is this. Live by faith because without faith it is impossible. It's impossible to please God. You can't do it without faith. So do you want to please God? Enoch's shown us the way. You have to answer these questions. Do you believe that God exists? Do you believe that God exists? That's the first characteristic that Enoch was able to... Yes, he lived his life based on that. Are you seeking God's rewards? This is the second question. Are you seeking God's rewards above all other rewards? Is that first and foremost in your life as you're following Jesus? And finally, have you dedicated yourself? Have you dedicated yourself decisively by taking off that old self and putting on that new self to be able to walk with God, to be able to have it said of you, he walked with God, she lived for Jesus. What a great way to be able to live life. Because the reality is we never know how long that walk is going to last. It was early on the morning of September 11th, 2001. Tom McGinnis, he kissed his wife, Cheryl, goodbye that morning, and he left for Boston's Logan Airport. He was scheduled to co-pilot American Airlines Flight 11, going from Boston to Los Angeles. Cheryl, after driving their children, 16-year-old Jennifer, 14-year-old Tommy, to school, she poured a cup of coffee, she grabbed a quilt and her Bible, and she sat on the back porch of their Port Portsmouth, New Hampshire house. Just as she finished praying, the phone rang. It was a friend asking if Tom was home. When she said no, he hesit hesit hesitantly told her that a plane had been hijacked and he and his wife were on their way over to the house to stay with her until they knew that Tom was all right. In panic, Cheryl grabbed the TV remote, but the fingers, none of the buttons seemed to work as she tried to find out what was going on. And then Jennifer and Tommy called. They'd heard the report at school, and they wondered, is Dad all right? Is he okay? And so the house quickly began to fill with friends who came to pray with Cheryl as they waited for news. She was so frustrated because none of the details were coming. And then Boston's chief pilot for the American Airline Hub arrived and sadly gave her the official word, Flight 11 had not only been hijacked, but it had been flown into New York City's World Trade Center and crashed there. Cheryl reeled at that point, hysterical. No! No, God, please! Don't call him home. She sobbed. 
It wasn't long before her worst fears were realized. And with that, Cheryl began to recall their last night together, that night before when they had celebrated Tom's 42nd birthday. It had been a great family time together. Da daughter Jennifer had given him a gift certificate for the two of them to have a father-daughter date at an Italian restaurant. Uh, Tommy, the son, his gift was that he would spend time with his dad working to clean the yard. And that night, as the night drew to a close, Cheryl had told Tom how she'd seen God shape and mold him over the years and how honored she was to be his wife. And as she'd said again, I love you. Her, his eyes had shone back at her with a delight that her depth of expression gave to him. And so as she replayed that evening, that special evening after getting word of his death, she was so grateful to God that God hadn't told her what the next morning was going to bring. If she'd known, if she'd known what was going to happen, she was convinced that she would have spent their final hours together pleading and arguing with God not to call her husband home. She writes, our last night together would have been very different. Realizing this, it helps me to accept that God knows the times and the seasons in our lives. This is faith, people. This is real faith. And, and, and I don't need to know everything. In fact, she writes, I shouldn't know everything. I just need to move forward trusting God each step of the way. This stirring example of walking by faith concludes with these words from Cheryl. I cling to every promise. To trust in the word of God is hard sometimes. Yet at the same time, it brings incredible peace. A few weeks before Tom died, he told me to trust in God if anything ever happened. Something did, and it was terrible. But I am trusting God and finding that he is truly trustworthy. If you wonder at all what faith that pleases God looks like, you don't need to wonder any longer. Take God at his word. Trust him. And then as you walk and he leads, one day you will enter into his presence, having pleased him very, very much. Let's pray. Jesus, even as those tender, powerful images touch my heart of a husband-wife relationship, of knowing how special that is as we are privileged to walk life together, following you and pleasing you, and as strong and lasting as that bond might be, that it only lasts as long as we both shall live. Above and beyond that, our God, there is that relationship that exists with you because of that relationship that comes when we follow you through Jesus Christ. We don't know the details of life. We don't know what the next moment even is going to bring. Thank you, Father, that like Enoch, we can follow you. Believing that you exist, seeking that reward that comes because of our desire to please you, desiring to live each and every day to the best of our ability as guided by your Spirit. 
that we might please you. And so, our God, we thank you. We thank you for being able to have that kind of relationship. And if there's anyone, God, hearing these words right now who doesn't have that relationship, God, meet with them right now. There's no human being that's necessary. All you need to hear from them is their desire to say, I want to live my life for you, my God. I want to follow Jesus. Thank you, God. We love you. We follow you. We want to please you. Amen. Just want to say have a great week. You know now that we're walking toward a day to be able to meet together where we're going to be able to worship on the lawn. But there's so much of life to live. Live it knowing that you're God. Your God will guide you faithfully. And take just a couple minutes now. Judy's going to take us out of this service just with a beautiful song encouraging all of us to be able to follow him because he's all that we ever needed. He's all we ever needed. Just uh, take those last few moments as your benediction, as you prepare to leave this time of worship and go out to live for your Savior. God bless you. We love you. We look forward to being again, together again very, very soon. See you then.